Hello, and welcome to the Collective Church Podcast. These messages are from our Sunday services at the Collective Church in Boise, Idaho. If you are new with us or just checking us out, please visit our website at collectivechurch.org. We would love to hear from you and connect with you. We pray that this message is both uplifting and encouraging. Get the Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Philippians. Now, this letter Paul writes from prison to the church in Philippi. Now, the church in Philippi is in an interesting place because Philippi is a town that had become a retirement place for uh, generals in Caesar's army, in the Roman army. So the, the people who lived in Philippi largely pledged allegiance to everything empire. And so in the middle of this incredibly challenging place, there's a church that's planted that's declaring a different king and a different kingdom, a different allegiance. It's not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. And Paul writes this letter to these group of people who are pressing back against the prevailing winds all around them and doing it at the risk of their own lives their own reputations. And so Paul writes a letter to them to encourage them. And the letter uh, for us, it's in a different format now. It didn't have chapter and verse when Paul wrote it. It originally was a letter, uh, but we've broken it down uh, over the years. And so there are four chapters. We're going to take 14 weeks to go through these four chapters. Um, So we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into this. Uh, We could do it a lot quicker, but I think there's too much in here. Now, the series title is Unfinished. Now, here's a truth that we have to keep in mind. Uh, If you're alive, your life is always changing, right? I mean, I'm 48 now, and I'm changing in all sorts of ways. I have less hair uh, than I used to have. My hair is a different color than it used to be. Uh, All sorts of things change. It doesn't all always go uh, downhill. I mean, I think the older you get, sometimes the stronger you get. And hopefully, the wiser you get. Right? There's all sorts of benefits of getting older. And there are a handful of drawbacks. But the reality is, my life, and I can guarantee your life, because you're sitting here and you're breathing, is always changing. Now, to change is also to grow. And to grow is to actually be alive. Now, here's the other thing that's true. Anytime you stop changing, you stop growing. And when you stop growing, you start dying. See, we're created for change. It's actually baked into every part and piece of creation. It was God's intended desire that change would always be taking place. Every part of creation is still unfinished. That includes you and I. This actually was a way in which the ancient Hebrew mindset actually functioned. They, they held tight to this truth, this reality that what God has created is still unfinished. All of creation is actually unfinished. I mean, God created trees with seeds, right? And those seeds would bear more trees. He created animals with the ability to create more animals. He created humans with the ability to create more humans. See, the Hebrews believed that creation was moving. Creation was going somewhere, and we're a part of that. And and so the reality is, where we are is not where we're going to be, and we're also not where we used to be. We're changing. I'm not who I used to be, and I'm not yet who I'm going to be, and the exact same thing is true for you. We are, along with the rest of creation, unfinished. See, God created everything that we have. He separated light from darkness. He created uh, the land and the seas, uh, everything that swims in the seas and flies through the air and walks on the ground. And he created all of it with this this unfinished reality. And then in the middle of this unfolding reality that is unfinished, he places us, humanity, created in his image, to do what he has been doing. 
to take this good news to the very ends of the earth because the gospel is still unfinished. The words themselves, the reality is complete. Jesus said, it is finished. What was finished is that you and I now have access to all we need to live the life that we are created for in relationship with Jesus. He brought us back into this right relationship. And then the unfinished work is that there are people who have not yet heard, have not yet experienced, have not yet known that they're created in the image of God. And so you and I have this unfinished work in our unfinished lives, in the unfinished creation. Our conversation today is going to really center around four things, and uh, we'll unpack them in just a moment. Servant, citizenship, grace, and peace. Now, the primary text for this series over the next 14 weeks is this. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, we'll get there in a week or two. He says, And I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. See, baked into the the text that we are going to center our series around is this unfinished reality. See, God has begun a good work, but that good work has not yet been completed, and it will one day finally and fully be completed, but that will happen on the return of Christ Jesus. That's out in our future. But until then, you and I are an unfinished part of this created act. And so we're going to spend some time unpacking that because the reality is You're unfinished, and that's really good news. God isn't finished, and neither are you. God isn't finished with you. Let me rephrase that. God isn't finished with you, and he wants you to understand that there's a work that he will bring to completion. So we're going to jump in and talk about a couple verses this morning. We're just going to really cover uh, verses 1 and 2, and this is what it says. This is how Paul opens up a letter that he's writing from prison to these people in a challenging place called Philippi, where a church is birthing, coming to life. Paul writes, identifying himself, Paul and Timothy. Uh, Paul was the mentor of this young pastor, Timothy, and he says, servants of Christ Jesus. To all God's holy people, in Christ Jesus, in Philippi, together with overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul and Timothy, servants, he says, of Christ Jesus. Now, that's a powerful and really important word. This is how Paul chooses to identify himself. He states his name and then his identity. He said, I am a servant of Christ. This Word, doulos. Can I hear you say doulos? This is the Greek word for servant. And it means, listen to this, devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. A servant. Paul says, this is who I am. It's an important distinction. It could be translated slave as well. Uh, Paul is um, declaring this at the opening of this letter to remind the people who are going to read it who he is, who he's committed to, and what they can expect. Devoted to another, to the disregard of one's own interest. See, Paul understands this full well, right? He's in prison. He's in prison not because uh, of anything other than Uh, being a servant of Christ Jesus. He's declaring this good news, this good news that is different than the the Pax Romana, the Roman good news that is uh, pervasive in the places he's going. Paul's declaring this gospel, this good news, and in the middle of declaring it, he finds himself in prison. But he finds himself in prison over and over and over again. This isn't the first time, and it won't be the last time for Paul. Paul's chosen to identify himself this way. See, to be a servant of Jesus, it can be difficult, it can be dangerous, it can be challenging, and it can certainly be uncomfortable. And here's what I feel like I've discovered in in my uh, fellowship of Jesus. 
is that anytime I find myself with the absence of difficulty or dangerous situations or challenging or uncomfortable conversations, what, what I've realized is I've, I've stopped exercising my faith. I stop living in this sort of risky obedience and trusting God in radical sorts of ways. When I don't find that, that um, there is a measure of difficulty and danger and challenge and discomfort that, that I've chosen to kind of hide myself away and uh, live in a space where I feel safe. But the reality is, according to Paul and certainly according to Jesus, more importantly, that the life we live in will have trouble. And I love that Jesus said, but listen, I want you to understand that, that just because trouble is there doesn't mean that you lose heart. He said, I want you to take heart because I have overcome the world. There's this beautiful declaration from Jesus to say, life isn't going to work out the way that you want it to always, but what I want you to know is that there is a life coming that you can find in me that has fulfillment, not just now, but on into eternity. So in this present place, take heart. I've overcome the world. Paul says, I serve Jesus. And he didn't serve Jesus because he had no other choice, no other option. He served Jesus because he had discovered that that's where true life actually came from. He pursued it in all sorts of different ways. Paul says, like, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. I've gone as far as I can go. I'm at the, basically the top of the food chain. And still there's, there's this measure of dissatisfaction that is woven into my life and I can't figure it out. Education didn't do it. Money didn't do it. Relationships didn't do it. And it wasn't until he was face to face with Jesus that he found the, the peace and the grace that he had searched for his entire life. And he said, because of that grace and peace, I will serve you fully and completely. And that's what he did. So servant. And we'll get back to these first two uh, at the end. And then next, citizenship. Paul, in the introduction of this letter, says, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people, listen to this, in Christ Jesus, in Philippi. Right? This is interesting because any time that Jesus is Lord of your life, if you've said yes to Jesus, you will find yourself always in two places at one time. Which, you know, for us in the physical realm seems impossible, right? Like I can be here and nowhere else right now. But when Jesus is Lord of your life, you, you carry this sort of dual citizenship. You can all of a sudden be in two places at one time. I am in Christ Jesus and I am in Boise. I'm here now. I carry this dual citizenship. And I have permission to be in two places at one time, understanding that my citizenship in Jesus actually impacts my citizenship here in the United States. It's not the other way around for me. See, that is the place of citizenship that is first and foremost in my life, and it informs everything else that I do in my life. So being in Christ is first and foremost, and secondary it's where I find myself located. Now, the first citizenship is locked and loaded, doesn't move, is fixed in Christ. And then you take that citizenship everywhere you go. To the grocery store, to your workplace, to your home life. Anywhere you go, that citizenship goes with you. See, for, for Paul, being a servant was about identification. So there's not only identification, but there's also location. And both those things have to be held in tension. The identification as a servant and then the location of in Christ and in Philippi. A servant and citizenship, they, they go hand in hand. And then Paul ends that section with two powerful words. The first is grace and the second is peace. Grace and peace, he says. Grace and peace. Now this word grace is an interesting word. It's the word charis in Greek. And it carries this, joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, favor, acceptance, loveliness, 
a favor done without expectation of return. That's what grace means. <laughs> Would anybody like a little bit more grace in their life? I want a whole lot more of that in my life. Joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, favor, right? I mean, who doesn't want more of that? And Paul opens up this letter and says, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. This ancient Greek philosopher, Spiro uh, Zodiatus, he says, Grace is the absolutely free expression of the love of God, finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of God. That's a great definition. Grace and peace. Now the word peace, it's also uh, a powerful, significant word. It, it's the same, so this, this word in um, Greek is the word irene. It's the same word we find in the Old Testament in Hebrew uh, for shalom, same word. And this word means wholeness, completeness, harmony, health, prosperity. Irene or, or shalom. Paul opens up this letter and says, grace and peace to you. This is how Paul starts every letter he wrote. Every letter that Paul wrote in the New Testament opens with grace and peace. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, which we just read, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Every letter Paul writes, this is how he opens. Grace and peace to you. Now, grace and peace to you is an important declaration because grace is a a very Gentile way of greeting someone. In Irene, it's a very Jewish way of greeting someone. See, Paul is communicating the reality that Jesus is making the two groups one, erasing the dividing wall of hostility that separated the, the people uh, who said we're God's chosen people and the people who weren't God's chosen people. See, in Jesus, the dividing wall of hostility gets knocked down so that the two groups are made one. A single group called humans. And the distinction of human is a high calling. I mean, have you ever made the statement or heard somebody say, well, look, I'm only human, right? I'm only human. I mean, come on, what do you expect? See, here's what I would contend. It's not that we're only human. It's that we're not human enough. See, you are a combination of dust and divine, the, the soil and the spirit. Being human means being Christ-like. That's the beauty. We were created in the image of. And so being human is a high calling a high calling that carries with it the responsibility of someone who not only receives grace and peace, but as someone who's willing to release grace and peace. Because what I've discovered is that I can't give what I don't have. And if you try, you'll fail. You just can't give what you don't have. Grace and peace, Paul says. See, words are important. Words are significant because they will create or they will destroy. They'll build up or they'll tear down. Remember the, the statement made one time by someone long time ago who said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but somebody, words may never hurt me. Whoever wrote those words had been wounded deeply Right? See, we get to this place where we feel like, I'm going to guard myself and I will never let another person in because I've been wounded. I've been hurt. I'm in pain. And here's the challenge. We don't like pain because we weren't created for it. And so to experience pain, uh, we have to do something with it. And words are a big part of that. And so Paul says grace and peace. I mean, words have the power to create categories, to shape worldviews, and even create worlds. That's what God did. He spoke. And with the word, creation burst forth. 
Your words are powerful. And what I would contend is that we need the words grace and peace at an ever-increasing level in our lives. We need more grace and peace, not only in our lives, but in the world that we live in. And guess how the world gets more grace and peace? You. You, you are the, the carrier, the distributor, the one who will release grace and peace into this world. Not because you are who you are, but because you are who you are in Christ, in the place that you're located. There's an identification of who you are, and then there's the location of where you are. And everywhere you are is an opportunity to be someone who releases grace and peace, but you can't give what you don't have. And impact is unavoidable. And what I mean by impact is influence or a mark in this world. There's no way for you to avoid having impact or influence in this world. Now, you are responsible for what kind of impact and what kind of mark gets left, but one being left isn't an option. You will leave a mark in this world. You will have impact and influence in this world, but your impact is determined by what you allow to influence you most. Right? Whatever you allow to influence you most will have a direct influence on the impact that you have. So I wonder how often we spend time thinking about what influences my life most. There's lots of categories. It could be Fox News, it could be CNN, right? It could be YouTube, right? It could be um, your neighbor. Uh, it could be your, your kids or your spouse or your coworkers, your friends. There's a lot of things that influence our life. And being influenced is also unavoidable. But what influences your life most will determine the impact that you have. What influences your life most in this season as you sit here today? It's important to be able to answer the question because if I would say it isn't the grace and peace of Jesus... First and foremost, we might want to figure out what's, what's holding that top spot and begin to shift and reorganize things in a way that creates the greatest impact we can possibly have. Back in Acts chapter 20, we just finished the book of Acts. But in Acts chapter 20, it says this. This is Paul now. Now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Like, how many of us wouldn't have stayed right where he was? Really? Prison and hardship await me in every city where I'm headed? Every? You know what the word every is in Greek? Every. Without exclusion. Every place he's going to go is going to be hard. And prison awaits him. But listen to this. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. May my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And then he says, this is the task. I'm going to tell you right what it is. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. <laughs> he said, this is, this is my task. I have to let people know how good this is. It's easy for me to sacrifice enough to get what I want. And I bet it is for you too. But it's a whole different thing and requires a whole lot more to sacrifice enough to get what God wants to give us. To follow him wholeheartedly, recklessly almost, if I can say it that way. With an abandonment. And this is what Paul is doing See, Paul's willing to sacrifice enough to get what God wants to give him, to complete the race, to, to finish the task set before him. This task of, he says, testifying. This is a powerful word, testify. And uh, it's the word that we get our English word martyr from. When Jesus, at the beginning of Acts, says, you will be my uh, witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He, this is the word he uses 
you will be my, my witnesses. You will testify. And it means to give information, to bring to light, to confirm. Testify of the grace and peace of Jesus. I mean, how good is this grace and peace, right? Let me, let me give you an example of how good this grace and peace is. At the very end of Jesus' life, this is out of Luke chapter 22, says this, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, I want you to think about this for a moment. Just think about this. Jesus is hanging on a cross, innocent, innocent of every accusation, spotless, blameless, this is the task for which he had come to finish. And hanging there, being ridiculed, he utters these words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So he utters these words, and then if he looks down, they were dividing up his clothes by casting lots. I mean, any last bit of dignity is gone. And there, and there he hangs and says, Father, forgive them. And that's how good this grace and peace is. It's that good. Who, who are the them that Jesus is praying for? Well, it's all those who arrested him, accused him, abandoned him, rejected him, spat on him, beat him, and nailed him to the cross. Every single one of them. Father, forgive them. See, forgiveness flows from the place of grace. And peace is the result of that. Forgiveness flows from grace. And peace is the result. I mean, how do you know if you've forgiven someone? How can you know? Well, I said it. I think the surest way for us to know we've forgiven someone is that you have peace. There's a peace that's present in your life. You aren't saying, I forgive you, and secretly cursing them under your breath. You're free. That's what happens when peace shows up. You're free. I mean, how do you know if you've been forgiven? There's also a peace that you receive. Because one of two things will happen in our lives. We will either be captivated by Jesus or we will be held captive by something or someone else in our life. There's only two options. We'll be captivated by the one in whose image we are created or we'll be held captive to something or someone else. And the something or th someone else uh, really wants to steal, kill, and destroy the life that you were, you were created to live. I mean, here, here's what I'm wondering. What if, before we gossiped, slandered, ridiculed, or judged, what if we simply said grace and peace? Grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. Those are not easy words to say because saying them means you're going to withhold saying something else and the other things are just far easier to flow from our lips instead of grace and peace. Maybe we need to receive it again so that we can give it again. We receive it and, and we give it. See, I've found that I'm really only free to bless the people that I'm not busy judging. It's kind of what I found in my life. I'm free to bless those people that I'm not busy judging. And the same is true for you. Uh, blessing and judgment do not flow freely from the same space. This is what Peter writes. 
Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Gosh, I mean, that's easy. Anybody can do that, can't we? We may have done it this morning. I mean, this is easy to do. Anybody can do this stuff. Um, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Isn't that interesting? You were called to bless people so that in the process of blessing them, you inherit a blessing. For who, uh, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. <laughs> That's such a good word, to seek peace and pursue it. He's, he's quoting, Peter is quoting a proverb that we are to be a people who turn from evil but seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his eyes are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Blessing. To praise, to give thanks, and to speak well of grace and peace. Is there anybody that you need to, to speak grace and peace to today? Is there a, a moment maybe you've held on to and you feel like, gosh, you know, I, I want to forgive them, but I, if I forgive them, it means I condone what they've done to me. It means I justify their actions. It means I have to forget it. No, no, no. To forgive them means to release them so that you have peace. To speak grace and peace to them so that you find freedom. Hanging from the cross, Jesus gave us permission. Father, forgive them because they're gonna need to forgive other people. And they're gonna need to do this through grace and peace. See, this is the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is always about absorbing evil, not perpetuating it, always. The way of Jesus, it, it transforms the pain of this world from destructive impulse into creative power. Do you understand that? That's what the way of Jesus does. It, it transforms our destructive impulse into creative power, but we have to be a willing participant in that. Be willing to absorb that pain rather than pass it on. Passing it on is what, what makes most sense, doesn't it? I mean, it makes, makes most logical sense. Well, uh, I was hurt, so it's my turn then to produce the pain. Anyone can return evil for evil, but it takes courage and creativity and imagination to actually return evil with good, to be able to bless, to be able to say the words grace and peace to you. I mean, it's no wonder, right, that Jesus said, anyone who would come after me, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross first. Why? Well, because the cross of Jesus was the example of what it looks like to absorb the pain of this world, not pass it on. That's what he said in that moment. Father, forgive them. I mean, with the word, he could have cursed all of us. But instead, he utters the word forgive Forgive. And if we want to follow Jesus, we have to first take up the cross because it's the cross that absorbs the pain, not passing it on. And so I want to bring us back to servant and citizenship for just a moment. Who are you? How do you identify yourself? There's lots of ways you can do that. Failure, divorced, successful, powerful. I mean, you name it. There's a lot of ways you can identify yourself. How do you identify yourself this morning? You could identify as a son, a daughter, a mom, a dad, friend. Who are you this morning? And then, and then where are you? Identification and location are important. Where are you? I Man, I know right now you are here, but where else are you? 
in Christ, in Philippi, right, Paul says. Two places at one time. Where else are you? Identification and location. Here's what it says in chapter two. In your relationships with one another, we'll get here in several weeks. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. See, the only way to have the mindset of Christ Jesus is to be located in him, right? Where are you located? Because that will determine how you think about the world you live in. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You've been given the, the mindset. Another word, to, way to translate it is attitude of Jesus. But guess what happens? You have to, to use it. You have to put it into practice. You have to choose in that moment where uh, you've been wronged and the desire is to wrong in return. When you've experienced pain and the desire is to pass that pain on, you, you have to use the mind of Christ and actually choose grace and peace. Receive it and, and then release it. I love this. Paul goes on to write, right after this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to uh, be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a what? A servant. That's the same word Paul uses to describe himself very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross, Jesus says. See, here's what happens. You can't wear the crown unless you carry the cross. And you were created to wear a crown. You're a son or a daughter of the king. But you can't wear the crown unless you carry the cross. And so, I want to give us three things as we move to a time of response. Um, After being alive for 48 years, most of which I remember, and the second half of my life being in pursuit of Jesus, this is what I've discovered, that, that I have a tendency to look a whole lot more like Jesus the more my life is in service to those around me. Paul says, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. That's how I identify myself. Of Christ Jesus. And see, when you're a servant to Christ Jesus, guess what? You're free to live in this place of humility that sacrificially serves those around you. You're free to do that. The more I look like Jesus, the more I serve those around me. Because here's the, the converse of that the more you live for yourself, the more you the less you can live with yourself. That's also what I've discovered because I've tried that too. The more you live for yourself, the less you can live with yourself. And so, here are the three things. First, I'm not going to unpack these. Uh, We're going to move to a time of response. The first is humility. Humility lets loose of control and allows you to live free to serve from this place of security. And then honor. Honor is this currency of the kingdom because it acknowledges that the other person's worth and value, uh, they're worthy to be served and valued. That's what, that's what honor does. It acknowledges that in the other person, their worth and their value. And then hope, humility, honor, and hope. Hope is the, the joyful expectation of a victorious outcome. we find ourselves as servants with this dual citizenship 
we have permission to say grace and peace. And as we utter those words, grace and peace, what comes with it is this humility, honor, and hope. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this message and would like to learn more, you can join us in person or online for services at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We would also love to connect with you. You can fill out a connect card on our website at collectivechurch.org and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.